Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome to, to uh, UE Guardian Group present, uh, presents uh, Conversations. All right, uh, this, is, this has been a long-standing tradition of the CTL, the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine Campus, as well as Guardian Group. Um, and this year marks the first year that we're doing this virtually. All right, the, the premium series has been a long-standing uh, event on our uh, calendars. Um, to be quite honest, it's, it's a total of, I think, 21 years um, we've been doing it. So it's 21st century education and 21 years we're celebrating this premium event or series. Uh, this morning, we have with us uh, Dr. Nancy Gleason. And we're happy to have her here. Um, the, to, 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 to really shed some light on the topic, uh, navigating the e-classroom, creating a culture of innovation and change. And we think it's a very timely uh, uh, topic and, and given the current landscape of education. And so we look forward to, to today's um, conversations. Now conversations is really a sort of informal, um, just as the name says, a, an informal sort of conversation um, amongst educators, amongst faculty, amongst educational stakeholders and uh, educational leaders and administrators and so on, and students to an extent, um, where we can talk about issues uh, relating to teaching and learning, yeah, um, among others. So uh, we look forward to today's uh, 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 proceedings. Um, I want to also take this time to remind you of the UE Guardian Group Premium Open Lecture, which takes place tomorrow evening at five o'clock. Um, you may or may not have seen the invitations via the via email. And uh, if not, please feel free to send us an email at ctl, ctl at sta.gwi.edu. And we will, or you can also send it to premium events CETL at sta.gwi.edu. And we will send you the invitation shortly thereafter. Now, to guide us and uh, for today's proceedings, uh, we do have some protocols. So uh, for the duration of this event, colleagues, we are encouraging you to keep your microphones muted. Yeah, this helps to minimize collective background noises and interruptions. Uh, but kindly note that we will have a question and answer segment, um, which will be facilitated later in today's program. Of course, if you wish to contribute to the discussion at any particular time, uh, you can be asking that you please use your the raise hand icon that's usually at the bottom of your screen. Um, uh, and we will acknowledge you and uh, we will recognize uh, we will recognize you. And then, of course, once you call your name, you can unmute your mic and proceed to make your contribution, whether it's a comment or a question. Yeah. Now, uh, you're also free to utilize the chat at any particular time. All right, the chat is usually located at, well, at the bottom of your screen or at the top. Um, so you just click on the chat feature and, uh, and we will also acknowledge those questions or comments accordingly, all right, during the, 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 the flow of today's events. All right, um, you're reminded of course to, <laughs> uh, of course all protocols observe and we want to keep it a, a professional um, event, you know, and, and uh, we want to make it enjoyable as well as enlightening and insightful. All right, so um, at this time, I want to hand over to Dr. Leroy Hill, who is currently the, the director of the CETL St. Augustine campus and our new director at that. So this is sort of an introduction and uh, uh, passing, things on, pa passing things along. All right, Dr. Hill. Thank you, Justin, uh, for that uh, introduction. You know, colleagues, we want to welcome you uh, at this time. Um, you know, March to 2020, 2020 will forever be in our mind as a point of departure from business um, as usual. You know, this. Can you guys see me? No, we're missing your camera. 
Yeah. It has failed to start. It was working a while ago. We can hear you fine. Okay, great. So I'll, I'll go ahead. So okay. I mean, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's clear that this new dispensation in higher education is important. And institutions have been resilient in ensuring teaching and learning continuity. And we here at uh, UE St. Augustine have certainly been resilient. And we have seen some faculty doing some really exciting and interesting innovative practices, um, uh, even though they were forced into this uh, situation. And in this business unusual opportunities for innovating our practice are even more endless than uh, previous, you know. And for this reason, many now place a deeper value and recognition for the growing uh, fourth industrial revolution and its impact, its influence on, on education. Um, in, in particular though, the focus is not so much now on continuity because we've been doing it, uh, we've been continuing, but now creating new pathways for ensuring that we sustain engaging and quality learning experiences um, and environments for our, for our learners. What does this look like? Uh, I, think, I think we here at the Center for uh, Center of Excellence and uh, Teaching and Learning, uh, working with the UV Guardian Committee, have sought to find the right person uh, to address this and to share a, 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 a deeper insight into this, to address us and to challenge us to think differently. And so it is with great honor that I introduce our distinguished speaker and, and, and UV Guardian Premium Lecture. Uh, for tomorrow evening, Dr. Nancy um, Gleason, W. Gleason, um, who is the director of the Hillary Balance Center for Teaching and Learning. And uh, Dr. Nancy Wilson is also professor of practice in political science um, at New York University, Abu Dhabi. Um, her research focuses on the fourth industrial revolution, uh, its impact on higher education, and the future of work. Uh, she considers the societal impacts of education, employment, disruption, continuous reskilling, and the role of industry in supporting up, um, upskilling of adults. She's the editor of uh, Higher Education in the Era of Fourth Industrial Revolution. She's also the co-editor of the Special Issue of Diversity and Inclusion in Global Higher Education. Uh, Dr. Gleason holds a PhD from Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, a Master's of Science from London School of Economics, and a Bachelor of Arts from George Washington University. So I, I, I really want us to give Dr. Wilson a warm children and to be a welcome by you using the, 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 the feature in the, in, the, in the room. Please say welcome. Um, please tell us in the, in the chat room where you are joining from in terms of I, we know you're, some, you're, some of you might be in Trinidad, but in terms of your faculty, your area, please let us know in the chat room where you're coming from. She's going to really be giving us a little teaser to what's going to take place tomorrow. So we welcome you to please ensure that you engage with um, us while we are in the chat room. So please go ahead. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Hill and Dr. Seferin. Um, and to the communications team, everyone's done a wonderful job. Um, coordinating all of us and getting us together. Greetings to all of you from here in Abu Dhabi in the um, Arabian Gulf. We say Sabah um, Nur, which is good evening. It's now 5.15 here in the night. And um, I'm just excited to spend the next day and a half with all of you, even if it is via Zoom, talking about one of the key words that Dr. Hill mentioned, which is sustainability. How do we sustain ourselves when we continue to be online, when we continue to be challenged by the pandemic and all the things that were there before the pandemic? And how do we become even better teachers while we're also trying to be scholars and parents and siblings and all the other things that we are? So I hope to speak with you today to give you, uh, as was mentioned, some teasers. Um, for my Guardian Premium Lecture tomorrow to all of you about navigating the, the e-classroom for innovation and just to get you thinking about some of the disruptions that we have and how we can leverage those for improved learning. So I'm only going to talk for about five or six minutes here um, and share some ideas with you and then I really look forward to, to unmuting our microphones and having a conversation about these issues. I do have two free books that I encourage you to download. They're open access. Um, these are mentioned in my bio, but um, if you Google these titles, you'll find them. They're free to download. 
Um, they're edited volumes and there's voices from all around the world there. I think probably closest to you is um, Professor Mueller, who's uh, Costa Rican, talking about what he calls regenerative development and education, um, for example. But there's some, some great contributions there on how post-secondary education is changing. So do check those out. I don't need to tell you we're living in a disrupted world, but I just wanna remind everyone that this isn't just about COVID-19. It's about the demographic pressures that our states have, the climate change pressures, and correspondingly, the sustainable development goals that we want to spend our time and energy on, and increasing pressures that these other things make worse, like gender inequality. Of course, this is not a uniform experience around the world. It's different in different countries and even within countries. But this means education has to change to prepare people for a new normal of disruption. COVID-19 may end, quote unquote, but there'll be another version thereof that equally displaces us. And we need to start teaching our students to be prepared for that. This is a schematic. I know it's tiny, so I hope you can see it okay. If you've joined on your hand phone, you probably can't. But it's from the Institute for the Future in California in the United States. And the spiky circles are drivers of disruption. These are shifts that are reshaping the workforce landscape, and I would argue also how we live. And the circles are the key skills our learners and ourselves need to thrive in this future, which I would argue for a lot of cities and urban environments is already here. So we need to be able to make sense of algorithmic communications. We need to be socially intelligent, simultaneously managing our own cognitive loads, right? Most students cannot absorb more than four hours of information a day. And if you have male students, their frontal lobes close later than their female students, not until around 24, 25. They have a different circadian clock. They sleep differently, all of these things. And we're trying to manage it all at once. It's exhausting. So we want to think about pedagogies. When I hear, you know, innovation in higher education, that can mean so many different things based on the quality of your learners, the financial resources you have, all of these things, the economy your, your, your graduates are entering into. But I like this schematic because regardless of where we are in the world, these are the skills we need to thrive whether it's a category five hurricane, a drought, a flood, a pandemic, or acute poverty, a war. It depends what's, what's plaguing your country at the moment, but these are the skills our students need to thrive. These are the skills we need to figure out how to make rubrics and assessment for. We need to figure out how to use our course content to let students practice these skills. And we need to figure out how to talk to each other across disciplines and academic silos to learn from each other. It's one of my favorite things about working in a center for teaching and learning is especially a global one is you can talk across disciplines and across cultural norms and try and create internal communities that will foster a type of learner that the schools are after. Right? Otherwise, we'd all just have one school because there's different choices. And the University of the West Indies is in a unique place in its role in higher education um, in TNT and in the region. So the essential elements I want to focus on today, perhaps, but I'm happy for the conversation to go in different directions, are integrative learning. Right? This is a concept defined here by the American Association of Colleges and, and Universities, um, but it's integrative learning as an understanding, as a disposition that a student builds across their time at your university, whether that's in their general education requirements, their extracurricular activities, their internships, and in our classroom studying our syllabi. And so when we teach them to connect these things and transfer them to novel environments, we're preparing them for disruption and we're preparing them for lifelong learning. And that's why the other thing I'm emphasizing on this slide is the ability to transfer. Because 
whether you have a student who, or family member for that matter, or yourself, who has, uh, for example, training in a specific technical and vocational area. Maybe that's um, um, nursing or, or um, even education, uh, something like that. How can you transfer that to then become a music teacher or, or a manager in, in a digital studio, in, in some new job that doesn't exist yet? The pace of change is so fast because of the disruptions that are upon us and the migration of talent is so great for the same reasons that we need to be able to talk to students about these skills, know how to design assignments to foster them and know how to assess them and give feedback for improvement. I think that's part of what we mean when we talk about innovative higher education. And I will just end with saying, how do we include our learners in these conversations? This is one of my classes from last semester. And I had the students design and run the discussion forums. And this meant they all turned on their cameras. They don't, I, in my class, I don't have a requirement that you turn on your cameras um, during remote instruction or home-based learning is what we call it um, here. It's got different phrases in different countries, emergency remote instruction. But this was one of the ways I let them own the material. I prepared it with them. I approved it before they launched, but they also all listened to each other out of respect for each other. This built, built community. It helped peer-to-peer -peer learning and it helped them make connections across their prior educational experiences, which are vastly different at the university I'm at. NYU Abu Dhabi is 90% international students from 115 countries. So we are uh, perhaps uniquely positioned in, in the difference in origin of our students' educational background, let alone all the other different ways they show up as individuals. And so potentially, and I pose this to you for a conversation, this is very hard to change higher education, but are we now guides and coaches? Universities are no longer the sole purveyors of information. Information's everywhere. So maybe our role is to guide and coach them on how to use that information. And for that, we may have to upscale ourselves. We may have to get more consistent, in-depth training on how we perform our own jobs and how we foster that habit of mind for ourselves. Now, as educators, we are lifelong learners, right? By definition, we're always reading new things about our areas of expertise. But when did, was the last time we learned something completely new, uncomfortably new, or unlearned something we thought to be true, right? The, the, the most universal example is that all of a sudden Pluto was no longer a country, a, a, a country, a, a planet. Right, it got recategorized. You know, for for many people, this was like a fundamental change in how they understood science. So, imagine something that was perhaps less personal being asked of us. Um, and then, most importantly, because of these disruptions, how do we help make sure we guide and coach our students to be responsible citizens and ethical thinkers, especially when ethics is subjective. And sometimes you have two bad choices. Right? They're always looking for the right answer because they want the A. But how can we shift their motivations? This is part of that innovation as well. And lastly, I'll just say, why are we doing this? What is the purpose of our education? When was the last time you read the mission and vision of your university? When was the last time it was updated? Wait, what are we measuring when we teach and assess? What's the purpose of that assessment? Is it aligned to the learning objectives of the course or are those just two required certification sections on your syllabus? And what are we actually preparing students to do in the future? And maybe we know the answer to that, but then my follow-up question would be, how often do we tell our students that? How often do we communicate the purpose of what it is we're asking them to do? And so these are the kinds of questions I would love to have conversations with all of you about. Um, and I will stop my slides there and open it up for questions or comments or reactions. Uh, of course, I welcome you to disagree. And I will just um, use the caveat that I know I have a very thick American accent and I speak quickly. So if there's ever a time you can't understand, please ask me to just to repeat and I'm happy to do so.
So I turn it over to all of you for questions or comments. You feel free to use the chat throughout um, or a thumbs up or a wave or other reactions. I'm, I'm open to all forms of participation in, in the Zoom, Zoom sphere. Well, I'll start by giving a round of applause. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually having my hand round, but you can't see me for some reason. My video is just refusing. So I'm gonna turn on my video on my mobile device. So at least you guys can see me that I'm here. Uh, and very, very meaningful way. I, I, I want to, um, um, you know, just thank you for that. And while, while, while you were speaking on the la latter part, um, I was thinking in terms of the challenge to really allow learners to connect their, what are they learning for, for not even the future, but for the present. And what are some of the, I mean, if you were to give one technological, pedagogical, or even organizational challenge that we have right now that we need to overcome um, so that we can begin to address that challenge for learners, what does that look like? What, what, what were some of the things that you, you can begin to tease out or uh, address or help us to understand that? Sure, is that question for me or for everybody else? That, that's for you. Uh, okay, you know, okay. You. I mean, I think different bodies of students are going through different things. For me right now, I think there's a global crisis in mental health of our students. Uh, and they're trying to figure out how to manage their stress, their anxiety, their own disruption, their own financial challenges, alongside their potential, not always, imposter syndrome. Should I even be in university? How did I get in? These kinds of challenges. Um, especially for an elite institution like your own, I would imagine that there's a fair number of your students struggling with those identity issues. And for educators, particularly in this Zoom environment, we need to learn new ways to build community and let the students know they belong in the classroom. And you know, many of them have made great sacrifices to be there. So also holding space for that in the classroom. Once that happens, they really let down their guard. And this doesn't matter if you have 20 students or 400 students in the classroom. If you're on Zoom, dead panning, looking at them, telling them they belong and meaning it is, is extremely powerful. Using the learning management system to stay present and constantly message them with interesting updates or um, sending them out an audio message. I think um, these are the kinds of things that that help them know you're present in the course when you're still on Zoom and it feels a bit disconnected, especially three semesters into this, you know, and we don't really know when it's going to end. So I, I think a big challenge right now that may not have been there 18 months ago for most universities is how we make the students feel um, like they belong in the classroom. And uh, thank you, thank you for that. And in terms of, uh, because I think it's it's a, a combined effort um, for really helping the other stakeholders understand the full ramification of of in in, in this new dispensation. Um, what would you say to university leaders, um, administrators? You know, there's the, there's a there's a strong brick and mortar thinking that have received even some attention in how do we translate our organizational culture, um, you know, in supporting that culture for change. How do you go about doing that? Because I, I think one of the ways we, we, are, we are doing it here is really addressing the awareness of some of the things that we can be doing. But in some very meaningful ways, we've seen uh, institutions being very, very rigid with uh, sort of still brick and mortar thinking that they're trying to translate in the, in the online setting. What, what guidance would you give to us at this time in terms of us trying to chat or you know, the way forward and making it clear on how we should be operating and what we should be doing to ensure that there is success? Sure, well, um, part of this depends on the consistency of, a, of bandwidth that your students can afford, right? The, assuming infrastructure that can deliver electricity 24 hours a day, what is the bandwidth the students can afford and do they own their devices? So the institution needs to have that data. They need to survey the students. In terms of the faculty, the incentive, you know, we did the hard work because we had to, to quickly transition. That's very different than running a robust 
flipped classroom environment with different learning, different um, potentially different learning objectives, different uh, exercises for the classroom and these sorts of things. What I would tell the leadership is create the incentives for faculty to make those changes. And where's the teaching award for, um, you know, most innovative pivots during COVID-19? Mm. Right? I'm waiting for that at my university. We still have the old <laughs> teaching award and I, I want the new teaching award, you know? Um, so, you know, where is the, and I want it to be cash. I don't want <laughs> more money to do more research. So I think, I think these kinds of things, you know, where's the incentive for faculty? This is not volunteer work. This is a job and you can't bleed blood from a stone. As we say, that phrase does not go over well here, but anyway, um, I am always so conscientious of my um, metaphors or whatever, but I think, I think, uh, what are the incentives and then how do we train faculty to make the good teaching that they do visible? So that they aren't just submitting course evaluations at the end of five years of amazing teaching. Who's reviewing syllabi and rubrics? Uh, and where are the metrics for good teaching? What do they look like? Can the can the university be more articulate about that and mean it? Can our program heads or our department heads, our our chairs, send a thank you email to everybody that gets high course evaluations every semester, so that we know they're actually reading them? um these are these are just they're they're not a lot of work they're not even a lot of administrative work um and i would say in order to change the organizational stru structure across the board higher education leadership needs to say thank you in more meaningful ways more consistently okay that's that's quite insightful i'm going to log for paulson uh you can unmute yourself uh paulson skerritt um if you can go ahead and ask your question Yeah, good morning. Um, really enjoyed the presentation. I know one of the things that um, I, I this morning I woke up to a page length email from one student. Um, it's a matter of group dynamics and students working collaboratively. Somehow the tone of issues when they expressed issues have changed from when they were they had the opportunity to resolve those issues by being physically on campus. And now uh, where they still uh, are getting to know the students and that they have to do um, work collaboratively with somehow the, the crisis seems to be heightened. You mentioned the issue of, of the mental health of our students. Um, and hearing you talk about the need for us to make sure to find creative ways to engage with the students. But I just um, think that this is something that we have to really um, address um, because students are not getting the opportunity to meet. And, and when we assign them to, to work on assignments, the chances of meeting together and that seems to be leading um, to, to greet a crisis uh, for students. Um, so it's something I, like I felt a failure this morning. I said maybe group dynamics needs to be a, a critical um, part of the, the lessons we, we communicate, it needs to be formalized into our, our discussions with students. But um, I, I just made that connection with the point you made and thought it might invite yeah. some. Yeah, Paulson, thank you so much for that. I actually have backup slides on this issue for that very reason. I think it's one of the most number one things is the students are trying to learn a new way to engage. And I mean, what, there's 36 of us on this call, all 36 of us have different expectations for what it means to do good group work. We may even have 36 different rubrics, or maybe no one even has a rubric for that because we just assume that everyone knows how to engage with each other. And, and the students don't know each other. So part of this is about building community online, you know, and, and that usually has to happen in week one and week two of the semester. So we might be too far into it this semester to, to help them, but we could always do a sort of halfway point and say, all right, everybody, I'm sending you into breakout rooms and groups of two, tell everybody about your family tree, right? Um, and then go into another breakout room, re-scramble it and tell somebody else about somebody else's family tree, right? Something like that. But the, the group dynamics piece is really important because we may be stuck in this for a very long time and there's parts of it we're never going back on. So um, this is where faculty need to be way overly explicit on rules of engagement. So from now on with group assignments, I actually assign roles. 
And this is very well detailed in the book, um, Scientific Teaching by Jo Hendelsman um, from the University of Wisconsin. She, she developed this uh, and it has training ideas in the back. It has sample exercises, but it's scientific, not that it's a STEM teaching book. It's scientific in the method. Uh, um, and there she's explaining, if you say, you know, if I send people into breakout rooms, I will say the person whose name is closest to the beginning of the alphabet is responsible for taking notes. And the person whose name is lowest at the alphabet or closest to Z is responsible for sharing those notes out, for example, um, breaking it up. And then I always tell them when you go into the breakout room, you have to introduce each other and swap phone numbers on WhatsApp. And you have to practice pronouncing each other's names for the first three minutes. You know, in, in my case, their names are all very uh, unusual to each other. Um, and, you know, talking about what it means to show up as your whole self, these kinds of things. Um, and then there's making the personal connection yourself. And this doesn't mean necessarily divulging personal information, but, you know, my children have three goldfish and I show pictures of the goldfish all the time. They're fly, flappy, shiny, and lemon. Here's what they're doing. The one semester lemon died. All the students were totally invested and they felt personally connected to me, but I didn't feel like I gave up anything of myself that would threaten my authority or stature in the classroom. And so I would say one of the things that's great, Paulson, is that your student felt comfortable to write you and, and rewarding that behavior. Because when we give feedback to students, it's about the process, not the outcome. So when we write back to students with those kinds of problems, it's not necessarily, this is what makes good group work with some kind of bullets. It's how do you get from this problem to a solution? Write me back with some steps you're gonna take. And I will then share those steps out to all the groups in the classroom and tell them they need to be pursuing these and that you want you know, email feedback from each group by the end of the weekend. Um, and I also have all of my students in a WhatsApp group that I'm not in so that they can ask each other questions about me without me knowing. Um, and I don't want that on the LMS, right? So these are different things that make them feel like they're in, they're in an in-group. Um, but it's very difficult, for example, if one student doesn't have bandwidth and the other two do in a group, they're going to move ahead with the group project without them. So there are resource disparities where students are still worried about getting the A, where they would leave someone behind. I, I, and I really don't know how we get around that in this case. So um, that, that disparity of opportunity when they're off campus is very difficult to overcome. And there, I think there's lots of resources on low tech opportunities. Um, audio submissions, they take much less bandwidth, for example. Um, and, uh, you know, an, uh, a transcript for a podcast instead of actually recording or making a podcast um, along a group um, line. So there's different assignments we can do to try and level the disparity of resources that our students may be experiencing. But in that case, the answer is not about how they make their group function perfectly. It's the process they do to improve the situation. Thank you for that, Dr. Gleason. And, and I, I think it's an excellent segue for us to maybe look at um, uh, the, the, the whole idea of collision and collaboration. And in many instances, there are some, some persons who may not have a clear idea of what the two are, and they've been, you know, in, in, in certain cultures is, is discouraged to actually work. And how do you do that to really value? Because if we're gonna build a sense of community, what, what, how far is to fall? What is, what is still as collision? What will be seen as collaboration? Because this is something that is quite, quite gray. And, and we, see, we see here that both um, um, Emron and Kafian value the idea of community. But in valuing the idea of community to, to really embrace embrace and building that sense of, of belonging, um, we are fearful of collision in terms of the, the, the whole idea of persons cheating or being dishonest. What do, we, what do we tell faculty to really give them that sense of comfort that, hey, you know, allow them to do certain things? 
Sure. This is a huge issue, right? Academic integrity during emergency remote instruction. Um, first and foremost, when there's collaborative work, the assessment should be based not necessarily on the outcome, but the process of collaboration, if that's the learning objective of the assignment. If the group work is to make your grading more efficient, then don't assess them on bad group work, assess them on the outcome. They always say, do not assess what you don't teach. And I, I can share a rubric with you um, from the American Association of Colleges and Universities. Can you all see this? Yes, you can. Okay, I know it's tiny, sorry. But this is a teamwork rubric. Um, contributes to team meetings, facilitates the contribution of team members, individual contributions outside of team meetings, fosters constructive team climate, responds to conflict. You can make conversations with your students around those things and have them peer grade each other. Now this is low stakes or no stakes grading. So basically a low stakes would be you get 2% of the 100% grade if you just submit that you tried this. That's a low stakes practicing collaborative teamwork. Now, and that's teaching that ability to collaborate and telling them that those are the criteria of collaboration, right? And you can find other rubrics if those aren't the ones you're looking for. Separately, if there's collaborative assessed work um, that is of substantial weight in the course, then elements of that that can be individualized will be very helpful. And um, again, almost like with class participation or engagement in the online environment, can you set up roles? Uh, I, I, so if it's a group of five, can there be a team lead? Can there be a, a manager of the bibliography? Uh, I mean, it depends on your discipline, what you would need. And can you link this to the real world? Then in those assessments, the students are both beholden to each other because you built that community in the classroom and they're motivated to do it because it makes them a better employee in that authentic setting. And, and that doesn't necessarily have to be associated with work. Um, depends what the course is on. But um, if you can link it to the real world, they're much less likely to cheat. But the other thing is we should be designing assessment to measure learning, not to prevent cheating and lean into that. If their grades go up, it probably means you improved your teaching. The student who is going to cheat is going to cheat regardless of the form of assessment. And that is something we have to constantly be doing quality assurance to check for. And it is a pandemic. So did cheating go up? Probably. But I don't think it will sustain. And we can remind our students that they're here and it's a privilege to learn. And that's not a one-time tisk, 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 don't cheat. It's a constant refrain of that with the privilege of higher education is an obligation to pursue it ethically and morally, right? And that th those ethics are rewarded in the workplace. They're rewarded throughout your life, be that in your faith or your secular life. You will feel better if you are honest, right? And this goes to the health and wellness crisis that the students are in. It's about how we come at them with compassion and gratitude rather than as enforcers. And when we tell them that the assessments are meant to measure their learning and not designed to catch them cheating, they will hear that. Now, like I said, the student who is gonna cheat just thinks it's easier now, but that student was already in your class. So um, the other way you can prevent this is drafts, now those are time sensitive, but you can use software like Turnitin. You can do automated grading, Perusal. I don't know, are, is anybody on the call using Perusal? I wrote the name in the chat. It's a free software out of Harvard developed by Eric Mazur, who is a Nobel laureate um, and a physics teacher um, and sort of now a sort of renowned teacher, educator, and scholar of higher education, instruction, and pedagogy. Perusal is a free automated grading platform. Um, it works best in classes of about 40 to 60 in size, and it's for reading annotations. Now, whether you wanted to use this one or not, 
the grading will become automated in the very near future, in my opinion. This doesn't mean we aren't responsible for assessment. It means that all of our attention shifts to feedback. So rather than spending our time worried about whether or not students are cheating, can we increase the time we spend on telling students how to improve? Even if they get an A, they could do better. So I think this, this is, um, this is part of it, is leaning into the learning rather than stressing about the cheating. Great. And I, and I think in, in, in a very meaningful way, um, the, the pandemic has democratized, democratized um, uh, greater accessibility for persons to be dishonest. But as you mentioned, I think the whole idea of an honor code and constantly reminding them of, of because this is one of those key aspects of competency that we for the world of work and I think stressing that more is is just as powerful as us being less of a police and more of reminding them uh, to be to be honest and, and good citizens and, and I, I'm so happy that you mentioned that because many times we spend a whole lot of time as educators um, you know trying to ensure that we create systems to, to avoid and then we, we're missing the bigger picture we're missing the bigger picture so thank you for that. I don't know if there are any questions in the, in the chat, any additional persons, any comment, please feel free to uh, take the mic. And I, I, I'm, go ahead, Paulson, I, I'll give you, a, it seems as though you're gonna get that badge this morning that we have, uh, so go ahead. I just wanna raise a, a, an issue. Um, I know Justin will probably blink when, when I raise it because I've talked about it before. So you mentioned that you don't have a policy for students turning their cameras on. I don't either. But I, I have noticed um, we, before the pandemic, we were teaching um, with a strong blend. So we, 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 we were used to meeting our students face to face maybe four times a semester and maybe the other eight or nine times we had um, you know remote classes with them. However, um, I've found ever since the pandemic, I've noticed that students, those, those students who have their cameras on in class, they tend to be more engaged, they tend to, there's a, there seems to be a relationship between their engagement in class and, and actually their, their grades, they're the ones who do much better, they, they meet the, the learning outcomes. Um, and I, I find that, you, it, that, that there needs to be some study done on it, but I think there's a relationship um, with that, that connection you have with students. Just last week, um, I, I didn't realize I was just sharing my screen and it was only when I was referring to things on, on the screen, the students asked me, are you sharing your screen? And I said, oh no. And then other students chimed in and said, we were just so pleased with your background. Now, I, I have a lot of plants in my office, my home, everywhere. I probably have more plants in my house than outside. But I don't do it for the students. I do it for me because I, I love being surrounded by, by plants. But they said they were just so appreciative and enjoying you know, forgetting about the slides and listening to me and focusing on the environment around. So I think that connection is important. And, and, and one student, I, we had an issue, and I was asking, who was your lecturer for that course? And he said, I don't know, we never saw the person for the whole semester. And I'm saying, I, I, I think I had to take a deep breath and internalize that concept. But it's something I think needs to be talked about, studied, and, and, and for us to be guided on that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, this is a very hard issue, especially if our students are from socioeconomic context within which it's embarrassing at home to turn on your camera, right? Um, or, or they have to talk about something they're not allowed to talk about at home, and so they're hiding from their parents, um, or you know, whatever have you. Um, and uh, I think, you know. If you have these conversations with your students, more will turn on their cameras, right? If you say to them, I wanna see you, I wanna see you smiling and I wanna see you suffering and I need to into it when you're flummoxed and when you're bored, I can't do that with your cameras off, right? But if you have a migraine, if you're in a place where you don't feel, I mean, for me, okay, in our case, my women who wear headscarves don't want to put on their shaylas and their gabayas and do all their makeup for one hour and 15 minute class. So they leave their cameras off. Otherwise they have to do all that work. It takes an extra 45 minutes. So does that mean that they're gonna never have their cameras on? No, but if there's a day where they didn't get to it, I just, 
I usually will do some kind of, I always do a Zoom poll. I was gonna do one for you all today, but I wasn't sure um, what, 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 what question exactly to ask, but just to show how it can get engagement. And I think, um, you know, I have students who will desperately DM me in the chat saying, I'm so sorry, I don't have the bandwidth today. I, I can either turn on my camera and not hear, or I can turn off my camera and hear, right? So um, uh, there's, there's a, there's a, there's the, that's the compassion side. The other side is being honest with them and saying, I can do better if your camera's on. You know, let's make a goal that everybody has it on for at least half the class. You know, what, or ask them what goal they think is fair. You know, and let them own that process too. Um, you'll end up with 100% cameras on, except for yeah. the poor kid with the migraine. Yeah, and, and, and it's, it's certainly insightful where it's not just the video, but I think the other aspect, into even for assessment um, a process that we can begin to feel our students in terms of what works or what can work with, with actually optimizing the outcome. Um, and we hear a lot, uh, um, even in this new setting of alternative and authentic, and there is that temptation to always use uh, the, the words interchangeably, and you know it's it's strikingly uh, important for us to really make that divide a clear divide because as you mentioned in terms of preparing our our learners for the world of work um, which is which is a clear I would say a clear miss opportunity if we don't if we don't really um, focus on that because we see so in some settings the, it's just a matter of taking an essay and making it an online essay or taking an exam and trying to make it a synchronous on, online exam and those sort of things. And I think it, it, it would be a missed opportunity if we don't, if we don't really embrace the, the, uh, the idea for us to bridge that divide between work and university or industry and university. Yeah, I mean, outside of academia, when do you write an essay at work? <laughs> now, that doesn't mean you, you need to learn how to craft ideas. Right. And there are some times where you just have to memorize information and the test is the best way to check if someone has memorized information. It's not to say these are not useful ways of assessing, but they do very specific things. And if it's only one way, students aren't prepared for everything. I, I see um, Kyra has a Kyra, question. Yeah. Good morning. Hi, for those who don't know, I'm Kyra Kujo and I'm from Guardian Group. Dr. Grisa, I just want to say, you know, I'm so grateful for this conversation this morning, and I'm listening to you. And what you're saying that does not only apply to academia. Um, we, the work from home situation is very similar. You know, you have meetings, and one of our mandates is um, the department need to have at least one meeting per week, and you need to see your staff because sometimes you're talking to us the cameras are off. You don't know what is going on with that staff member. They may be going through issues, but seeing them, you might be able to pick up something. And it's important to know how your staff is feeling, especially with this situation with COVID. They, I mean, it's so stressful, you know, some, some of them have children that they have to tutor and help while working, all right? And you have to work with them to make the situation as comfortable as possible. So I'm really, really grateful for this. And I'm so looking forward to your presentation tomorrow. Yeah. And, I'm hoping, and I'm hoping a lot of our garden group um, staff and, and executives and, and managers join in, you know, to be able to be part of this. Yeah, Thank I you. hope so too. I think tomorrow I plan to be a bit more controversial, so that will be good. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but I really like your point, Dr. Joe, that, that, that this is not just about our students. It's about us as well. It's about being compassionate and showing up with gratitude for each mm -hmm. other. And to the staff we work with as faculty, I know you use different language, but the lecturers and the non-lecturers or the academics, I don't, mm -hmm. every university has different language for the difference, but every university has a hierarchy, it's right? Um, and I think um, the, this is the part about resilience where we can mirror that behavior for mm -hmm. our students and for each other. Um, and I, I'll say, you know, here in Abu Dhabi, 
we're in a different space with the pandemic. A lot of things have gone back face to face, but not everything. And so I would think, I would say we're six months ahead of you, but I really think this is an ebb and a flow. So I don't know, we may go back into lockdown. But to say that going back face to face has been harder than maintaining remote because people are tired. They have this uh, theory that it's languishing, which is not a mental health disorder, but you're super unmotivated basically. And what's the point of anything? But it's not, a, it's not a depression. It's just like, it's a blah feeling that's sort of everywhere now. And I'm like, why do I have to go back to work when all my stuff is in my home office? And I'm not gonna move it because I might have to come back. So we're having a very hard time getting everybody back into the office. The faculty just won't go, they're kicking and screaming. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think these, these, we have two more years of these challenges. And so turning on your camera and talking to each other is really important. If that means you have to do your makeup and your hair, do it. It feels good to do your makeup and your hair when you haven't done. I put on perfume for Zoom calls now. No one can smell the perfume. <laughs> But it makes me feel more professional and dressed up, even though, you know, people can't even see what you're wearing on Zoom. So, yeah, yeah, you put on earrings. Exactly. It feels good. So I think, and this is, you know, or, you know, in small groups, I don't know what's allowed, allowed in TNT right now, but getting together in very small groups, three or four people. Um, I'm still remote with my students, but they're all on campus. So I've been having pizza lunches with groups of four every Thursday. And it will take me a while to get through the whole class and I'm spending my own money buying them pizza. But otherwise it's all within the health mandate because I haven't met my students in two years. So um, uh, I think, I think uh, all of this is, is ongoing. It's not done. You know, at my university, we have this like, we're back. I'm like, no, we're not. No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know that the leadership really wants us all to be back, but we're not. Yeah. So this and, is part and, of the time. Yeah, and that's what I asked in, in terms of the, the sort of brick and mortar thinking. And we, we, we have to constantly remind of the, 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 the social family constraints that individuals have, you know, and as you mentioned, it's, 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 really, it's really a difficult thing to do unless we really fully understand. And, and so we wanna thank you, Dr. Gleason. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions. We, we did promise this to be an one hour event and we, we really, I, my mind is really bursting with a lot of uh, thinking of, but I don't want to extend our, our time beyond what is allowed. And so we want to thank you for um, you know um, joining us for the conversation. Um, I'm going to give Justin the the opportunity to again remind us of the um, event tomorrow, and we look forward to seeing you. So I don't have any, any final questions, but we really want to thank you. And, and Petra is saying true on point office and homework. You know, is 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 a difficult thing. So we just want to say thank you. And what time is it right now? I mean, is it? It's 6 p.m. So I can still have dinner with my children. Okay, great. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. And I really hope to see you all tomorrow. And, um, you know, I'm always open to collaborations, writing papers together, thinking about our pedagogy. And I really hope someday I can visit face to face. Uh, I've been to Barbados. I did my dissertation in Paramarbio. Uh, in Suriname, but alas, I have only landed at the airport in TNT to get to Suriname. So someday I need to properly visit. <laughs> yes, definitely. And of course, when you do, we will um, introduce you to some of our, our, our delicacies, if you will. Um, <laughs> you know, whether it's the roti and the, the polori and, you know, all these other things. Um, you know, so we'll, we'll see, we'll, next time, of course, whenever you, you, <laughs> someone, someone said in the chat, uh, roti, baigan, choka. Uh, choka is a, um, I don't know how to describe that. It's not choka as in choka, but it's a, a, I don't know if Dr. Hill would want to elaborate on that or anyone for that matter, Ms. Kaju. Um, I guess. Yeah, it's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> but yeah. So oh, it's, say, it's, it's roasted melon jay, roasted eggplant. Yeah, it's, oh, it's, a, yes. it's, a, it's a melody of, of vegetables all cooked together and with lots of onion, garlic, and 
and pimentos or hot pepper on it. It's killing me. Chunky with with some olive oil or regular oil, and it tastes yummy. <laughs> oh my yeah. goodness! <laughs> and I, I I think you're getting the recipe in the chat right now. But if you, <laughs> I know I'm, just, I'm like yes, okay, yes, yeah, I'm yes. writing it down. <laughs> we tend to bond with food, as you probably realize by now, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. So maybe that's something. As as I think uh, in the conversation uh, you mentioned earlier, that you bond with your students by over pizza. Yeah. So yeah. there you go. I guess it's a universal language, mm -hmm. uh, right? <laughs> um, but uh, I'm not sure if there are any questions or comments that uh, persons may want to make. You could feel free to put them in the chat um, as, we, as we wrap up. Um, I really want to thank you once again. I joined Dr. Hill in thanking you, Dr. Gleason, uh, for, for the enlightened, for just the insightful conversation that you, you, you facilitated uh, thus far. Um, I think you gave us some really useful tips um, in terms of student engagement uh, in the online environment. Uh, just to recap some of the salient points, of course, engagement uh, uh, practices, things that we could easily incorporate in our, in our teaching practice. Yeah, um, uh, and like I'm seeing in the chat, uh, <laughs> uh, yes, the practical responses to the questions, and it's not just things that were too abstract, but things that we can easily take and apply or implement in our, in our online classes or online context. I don't wanna say classes because it also goes, as Ms. Kajou mentioned, beyond just academia or beyond um, just uh, teaching and learning and that sort of thing, but also in terms of uh, the professional arena or the corporate world where we do online meetings, you know? So I think, um, so I think, I think, I think it's very timely um, we definitely look forward to tomorrow's uh, premium lecture. I think it might be a different day for you, but <laughs> for us, it, it's uh, colleagues, it's Thursday, uh, the 30th of September at 5 p.m. All right. Um, and thank you, Dr. Hill, you just posted it. So, so if there are no more, I'm not seeing in the chat any more questions, and we're streaming live on YouTube. All right. So you simply just need to go to YouTube. Um, at UWI St. Augustine, I believe, uh, and you will see it there, all right? That's UWI St. Augustine, all right, in YouTube. So you just go into YouTube, type in UWI St. Augustine, you're gonna see the channel there, and uh, you, you should see um, at the top of that list, the, 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 it will be sort of a premiered event, yeah? Um, so we will be there to, 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 to welcome you and to present. Dr. Hill will, Dr. Dr. Hill will be there. Dr. Gleason will be there to, to, to give her open lecture. And um, so we are definitely looking forward to that. As Dr. Hill mentioned, it's just a teaser today. And so um, we're definitely looking forward to tomorrow's uh, open lecture. Any final comments by chance, Dr. Gleason? Uh, I just want to say thank you to both you and Dr. Hill for the generous introductions and conversation today and thank everybody else for joining. And um, I really look forward to engaging in the conversation tomorrow and um, maybe provoking, provoking more controversies and, and what we should and shouldn't be doing in the classroom. Yes, yes, definitely. So colleagues, if there aren't any more, any further questions, yeah, and, 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 and I see there's a request in the chat room for the link. Uh, if you can, if we can make it a promise, all 32 of us subscribe to the UE channel. If someone can post that in the chat. But once you subscribe to the channel, any event that we have, uh, you, will, you will get noticed of it. All right. So we, we will certainly will send in that, but we're looking for the YouTube channel at UE St. Augustine, as marketing has indicated here. We want to thank marketing for helping us in putting yes. this on. And what we will do is that we're gonna stop the recording and we will make like one minute because we know that some persons like to small talk and um, <laughs> you know, so we can certainly do that. Thank you so much, Dr. Gleason. And there we Thank have the link everybody. Uh, in the chat. All right. Have a great rest of the day. I will see you tomorrow or 